Yoregel Kivanok, Buna Dimenata, Guten Morgen. Good morning, everybody. Um, it's an honor and a pleasure to be here with you today. I have to apologize. There's quite a few of you already who know um, I'm very glad to be the father of two fabulous little twins. Uh, no, no, no. Thank you. It's not new. Uh, they're, they're 18 months old. But what I mean by that is that there was a pass, a moment before twins, where I had this luxury of staying up until three or four in the morning and preparing presentations and getting my quotes, my sources, and putting everything together. That doesn't happen anymore. <laughs> um, I spend about 50% of my time at home with uh, my children, uh, because anyone who says that we believe in humanism, in rationalism, and dignity and equality of people and has no problem going off to work while expecting that your female partner changes her entire life and stays at home um, while you just think that it's fun to come back and play in the afternoon. That's not necessarily what I would consider co-parenting. So I spend 50% of my time with the most amazing two little boys that I'm madly in love with and 50% of my time on the ground in Iraq or working to try and deal with the situation that's now happening across the Mediterranean, in Syria, in Libya, and more broadly. So. The reason I say that is because uh, what we have here, I hope, will be good and powerful. It's not everything that I was hoping to bring out, but we'll try and just uh, ad lib it and do it together as we go along. I will be speaking in English. But if you want to speak in Romanian, Hungarian, Norwegian, anything else, when we're doing the <laughs> questions and discussions, we'll be able to understand each other. Um, I wanted to try and start thinking of something that would be dramatic in a little wow moment. I didn't quite get there, but the basic of it was, I'm going to ask you to just take a moment, look to the person to your left, look to the person to your right, and just see each other. And there's a reason I want to do that. Because I came to the Romania for the first time in 1997. I had to convince someone she was going to marry me. It worked, hence the twins. Um, <laughs> I've been to 103 countries around the world. Not all of them recognized. Uh, most of them recognized. But one of the things that I saw in Romania, and one of the things that we see too much in many parts of the world, is that very often people are told one stark, incredible, and completely incorrect lie that very many of us usually believe. And that's that what is happening in the world, from the elections in Chisinau, I'm sorry that I missed that, to the situation now with refugees coming into the country, or what's happening at a political level in Romania, or our world economic system, that all of that, that's what is happening, is too big. And we can't do anything about it. That's the way the world is. That's how it will happen. There's no point doing anything because it's not going to bring about change. Have you ever heard the term, the expression, the phrase, child soldier? Yeah, yeah? that's one that we use broadly. So uh, children, sometimes youth, that are recruited into armed forces, trained as combatants. These can be non-military in form of militias, armed groups, insurgencies. Um, also many countries around the world. I'm a child peace worker. I uh, started working against violence in a program called WAVE in the Canadian educational system. WAVE meant working against violence everywhere. It was a program that with 12 year olds, 13 year olds, 14 year olds taught us about domestic violence and abuse in the home, violence that people face in their personal lives, and gave young people tools and the opportunity to understand and to become involved in addressing it. I left home at the age of 17 and have been working in war zones ever since with some of the most courageous, inspiring, and amazing people that anyone could imagine. And I only work on invitation. We only work anywhere in the world if we've been asked to be there. And when I say we, I mean the Romanian Peace Institute, the first international organization in Romania's history built by three volunteers with two and a half broken computers and refusing all foreign funding and never making a project application to work in other people's countries because we believe 
We only have the right if they have asked us to be there and they have to control the funding so that they can get rid of us whenever they want. I was just mentioning one year ago in this exact room, we had staff from the United Nations mission in Darfur and we had government leadership, very senior level and civil society groups from countries all across East Africa and many other parts of the world right here in Cluj in this exact room learning how to do effective early warning, peace building and prevention. That's a little bit, I can speak much more about the Institute uh, and other things after, but let's dive in. So, you can't do anything, there's no point, we can't change things. Just some, some of you may remember this picture, Nelson Mandela, just shortly after he was released from prison in Robben Island. Um, he was holding up the salute of the armed wing of the ANC and speaking about the right to armed struggle, but he then went on to be one of the greatest leaders that we have seen working for nonviolence, working for practical, meaningful, responsible solutions to the challenges that face our country. And as no single person can, he did not solve everything in South Africa, but he gave up until the last moment of his life, and he was involved to make a difference. Um, lots of people whose names that we don't remember, helping to take down the Berlin Wall, being told for years this would be impossible, it would never come down, this is permanent. The CIA estimate just before the Berlin Wall in no way included even the possibility of the collapse of the Soviet Union. It happened because people and citizens made it happen. And you can look in thousands of different ways, but one of the deepest, most systemic forms of oppression and injustice around the world, dominant systems of patriarchy and domination and oppression of women. And yet, one of the most incredible nonviolent struggles and movements in human history, women and sometimes with honest men in countries around the world, working to change that gaining the right to vote, gaining the right over sexual preferences, choices, recognition, <coughs> dignity, um, wages, and much, much more. Still a long way to go. I don't know if you've seen, there was a video that just went viral, a Danish uh, activist, scholar, intellectual who was being interviewed by a journalist. And what the Danish, uh, you can see this uh, on YouTube, what he basically said to the journalist is, you're wrong. You present a world as if it's torn apart by war, suffering, everything that's negative, and you say that as if it's the entire world. And he takes his shoe and he puts it up on the desk and he says, that's like showing people my shoe and telling them that that's all of me. Yes, there is war. There are these problems that are happening. And in some ways, getting pronouncedly worse. And we need to be very acutely aware to understand and to see what can be done. But that is not everything. One of the things that he points to is we have standing DNA sequencing to the Hadron Collider. Do you know about the Hadron Collider? Yes. Okay, Neil Turek, I'd recommend that you read his works if you can, one of the greatest minds in physics in the world today. His father was an anti-apartheid activist and they had to flee South Africa, move to Canada where he grew up. Neil's very involved in global human rights issues, but he's also one of the most brilliant minds in physics in the world today. And one of the things he says is, how many species can just on the basis of an idea invest billions of dollars to create something to see if it works? I mean, th this is pretty incredible what actually went into helping us to understand the fabric of the universe and existence. The Mars rover, this cute little guy going around there and just the capacity and the human quest for exploration and understanding is something on. I was with one of my colleagues and a good friend yesterday evening and we were discussing and I said, if people actually were able, even for a moment, to see, to get what the world, existence, the cosmos actually is, if from our daily troubles and everything that we're facing and dealing with, you just pause and you looked and you saw, it is extraordinary. So what are some of the global threats and challenges? He said, rationalism, humanity, dignity in the face of war, terror, radicalization. I apologize, this is a little bit of a long quote, but I'm going to read it out for us. The most dangerous radicalization is not the young man or woman who goes to join ISIS and fight in Syria, Libya, or Iran. The most dangerous radicalization is the normalization and acceptance of that which is neither normal nor acceptable. The acceptance of a world spending trillions of dollars to invest in death and war. 
the acceptance of our global economic order, where this year, for the first time in the existence of our species, the wealthiest 1% will have more wealth than the remaining 99% of humanity put together. Because, you know, they work so much harder than you do. <laughs> The acceptance of a way of life predicated on the destruction and pillage of our environment, bringing entire species to extinction and threatening the climate of our planet. The acceptance that violence and war are valid or successful ways of addressing conflicts. And the belief that these are normal, irrefutable, unchangeable, and there's nothing we can do about them. That is the radical, violent extremism we have all allowed ourselves to be party to. And it can continue only as long as we allow ourselves to sustain it. <coughs> Global wealth distribution. The top 1%, and that is how the rest of wealth is distributed amongst the remaining 99% of the world's population. Another, so I'm going to just go through a few, not everything, but a few of the challenges that are facing us. Incredible militarization of our states and of society, <coughs> including in Romania, where we've recently allowed the expansion and further development of NATO forward air force bases in the country, because that will help contribute stability to the Black Sea region and what's now happening. This is a picture from Ferguson, which many of you have probably heard of, St. Louis County Police. If you look at what they're wearing, these are not police uniforms. This is full combat fatigue. Some of you may have heard that the United States is facing a challenge. It bought so many weapons and so much military hardware and equipment for the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan that now that they've pulled out to a certain degree in Iraq and Afghanistan, they just have too much. Their warehouses, their stocks are too full. Why is that a problem? That could be a great thing. We've got that, so now we no longer have to spend on it. But if you're not spending on it, how is my weapons company making money? So we need to lower the stocks. We need to use that up. We're not fighting in active wars at the moment, so what can we do? I know. Let's sell it to our local police. So the federal government created a program where they subsidized the sale of armored personnel vehicles, surface-to-air missiles, and military hardware and equipment to local community police so that at a county fair where they measure who has the biggest and most beautiful pumpkin or cow or other things, you have an armored personnel vehicle parked outside to protect from terrorist attack. Mm -hmm. The challenge is... The pumpkins are going to blow up or what? <laughs> Don't start giving ideas. <laughs> the challenge is that when you start dressing in that equipment, when you put up signs in the parking lot of the police station, like there is in LA, called Forward Operating Base, and you're in a military mindset, and when you privatize the training of police forces, so that the largest provider of police training in the United States today is, <coughs> does anyone remember the company Blackwater, which was banned from Iraq, a private mercenary corporation? They've recognized that training of local police forces is a multi-hundreds of billion dollar industry, and they have now the largest police training centers, and they're the ones training. So what does that mean? Well, if the training you're getting is training in combat operations for local police, what skill set does that give you? Does it teach you nonviolent policing, community policing, effective problem solving to deal with incidents in the community? It teaches you to wear battle armor, to see whoever's out there as a threat and to kill. So you have a culture of fear. A culture of fear, culture of violence, culture of war. A young boy in Syria. A young girl. One of the most popular video games today, played by millions of children all over the world. Have any of you ever heard of Lieutenant Colonel Grossman? He wrote the book On Killing. It's required reading at West Point and many military academies. It is the most detailed study and understanding of what is the psychological effect of killing, what is involved in killing, how does it affect the mind, the people, and how do you train and prepare people for it. And he's opposed to it. He was a military officer who respects those who wear uniforms, doing it honorably, in his belief that at times it is necessary, but he is deeply concerned about the fact that the techniques used to reduce a human being's 
refusal to kill, because the military understands human beings generally, it is not easy to get them to kill. Military professionals know this. Popular opinion and what people discuss in cafes is something else. But real military, those who deal with this issue, they face the challenge that it's not that easy to get people to kill others generally. So they have programs to improve, to increase what they call the killingness ratio, the likelihood that that person, when placed in the situation, will do what you need them to do, what they want them to do, and kill. And what Lieutenant Colonel Grossman writes is the techniques that they're using are now being spread throughout our entire societies where they don't have the restraint and the prevention mechanisms. So what we're seeing is it seems normal. People just become used to it. World military expenditure dipped a lot, then it shot back up. Today it exceeds the height of the Cold War. Some of the areas where it's happening the worst right now, the Middle East. Middle East and also Southeast Asia with Japan, China. These are the two parts of our world where military budgets are dramatically exploding because they're also the most stable and, and without conflicts and problems. So, you know, having governments in the Middle East in a massive arms race with each other, that's not a problem. One of the reasons this is happening is because Western companies, including Romanian military uh, providers, Romania is one of the largest weapons dealers in the world, actually. Um, they are losing profit because of the ending of the war in Iraq and Afghanistan to a certain extent, or, or their country's involvement. So they're looking at new markets. And they're very thrilled if you see the weapons conferences um, at the opportunities. But the reality is we're the ones providing it. So it's wage war in Yemen. Saudi Arabia is using F-15 fighter jets bought from Boeing. Pilots from the United Arab Emirates are flying Lockheed Martins when they're bombing in Yemen and Syria. The Emirates are going to complete a deal with General Atomics for a fleet of predator drones to run spying missions in their neighborhoods. U.S. local police have now equipped drones with non-lethal weapon systems, so you don't need a police officer in front of you to spray you with tear gas or to electrocute you with a taser. They have now equipped drones to be able to do that. Isn't that slightly scary as I'm talking about this? We have the... Yeah. Have you heard of the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter? Do you know this one? The most expensive military piece of hardware built in history. This is its payload, uh, the weapons that it is able to carry. And from recent testing, the thing doesn't work. The F-35 fighter jet will find itself outmaneuvered, outgunned, out of range, and visible to enemy sensors, which is kind of a bad thing if you're supposed to be an invisible stealth plane. We have spent more than one trillion dollars in the production of this single plane alone. It was supposed to have a hundred billion dollar budget, which to a normal sane mind is insane to start with, a hundred billion budget. But now it's over a trillion, and you know what? It doesn't work. <laughs> non-democratic governance and the capture of the state by corrupt elites, by oligarchs, and by money systems. Now that's nothing new. If you look back at the Aztecs, if you look back at the Roman Republic, if you look back at governance systems throughout history, it's not as if they were all just this nice space where everybody's voice could be heard and protecting people's rights. Generally, states have been predatory systems. But as long as they have existed, people have fought to expand the space of rights and accountability. And there was a period where we seem to be doing a little bit better. And we thought, you know, more and more countries becoming democratic, more and more countries having uh, elections, human rights systems in place. But the reality is, if it costs you billions of dollars to get elected, or hundreds of millions to get elected, and you can only get that from a certain percentage of the population, how really democratic is that country? Do you know who these two are? Brothers. Right. More money than Romania as a country. But other things. How many of you are really paying attention to the current negotiations for the transatlantic trade agreements between the EU and the United States or the trans-Pacific trade <coughs> agreements? These address every freaking aspect of your life. They regulate who we can purchase school books from. They regulate how you can control food systems and agriculture in your country. They regulate everything, far more than the Soviet control system could even have begun 
to think about. The negotiations are held in secret. You have no knowledge of most of what is within it, but you're a citizen of your country. For most of us, don't worry, I do not believe one single member of the Romanian parliament or senate has any knowledge of what is in these agreements either. I've been dealing with trade negotiations before peace building, that was one of my main areas, for nearly 20 years. And in the past, one, that's a great progress. In the past, we had entire trade agreements being signed up to without even our ministers of finance and trade truly knowing what impact it would have on our countries. That's quite incredible. We can speak more about that. Non-accountable surveillance. Um, Snowden, Edward Snowden, releases all of this data about what a government is doing illegally, and he's the one in exile. But you know what's sad? Over 20,000 people had access to the information Snowden had access to. Do we ever think about that? 20,000 people had information to their government systematically violating its own constitution and the rights of its citizens and citizens of other countries, and 19,999 of them did nothing about it. Yeah. What's interesting is a lot of this surveillance that's happening is actually done with our full participation and contribution to it. This is Carl and Aaron in our yard, just a few <coughs> kilometers from here. Um, information which in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, if we knew that companies or governments were gathering that on us, then civil liberties groups would have been outraged and stood up for it. But we actually post it, and you know that thing where you have to click yes that you agree that nobody ever reads the terms of service and everything? That allows them full and total access to all of the information that is in your phone, in your computer, on these programs. But not only you're signing away for yourself, you're actually signing away all the contacts for your friends and colleagues and others. But I'm just suggesting that the scale and degree of this surveillance, the fact that it's used for harvesting data for private corporate profit, and that most of the large companies have agreements with national security agencies, should at least be something we're aware of and discuss. Because this scale of monitoring and surveillance of individual human beings has never existed before in the existence of our species. Just briefly, because I've already gone on way too long. Why are people joining, for example, radical movements like ISIS or violent movements like ISIS? Do you know these three, the 15, 16 year old girls who went to join ISIS from Britain? Okay, so there is no one single reason. There's not, this is the profile of someone who will become a terrorist. Someone is not born in a context of wanting to go blow themselves up or kill other people. There are multiple and dynamic causality. That's very hard for many academics, not in science and physics, but in other fields, especially in social science. We're supposed to argue, this is the reason, this is the cause, this is the problem of everything. Multiple dynamic causality. There's multiple factors, the interactions between them are dynamic, and they contribute to causing or creating the situation. But a lot of them, it's like smoking. Smoking won't guarantee that you die of cancer. It's just gonna dramatically increase the likelihood and the overwhelming majority of people who die of certain types of cancer are smokers. So having these conditions won't mean that every one of us will go join, but if you see people from your faith, from your country, dying unjustly, if the United States government has killed 500,000 civilians in Iraq and the Secretary of State, Madeleine Albright, goes on television, is asked about this and says, we think the price is worth it. And you see what is happening to people, not like we do, comfortably turn away and ignore it because it's happening to people in other countries, but you actually see it. Then you're not the radical, you're not the violent extremist because you go and join a movement that fights against it. You're fighting against the violent extremism of the Romanian government, which took part in the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, of the American government, of others. The problem is, it's on all sides. Now, they're very good at recruiting. So they have this, how does a Westerner join? What's the application process? They've, they're great on social media. They've got fantastic videos. And if you want, there's even a very helpful handbook. Um, it's hyperlinked, so you can click to go to one part or another. Everything you need for $178 to get all the equipment to go join ISIS. How you can uh, avoid surveillance systems, easy to find online. There is nothing like that that teaches people how to do peace building. 
If I'm a 15, 16 year old girl in Britain, if I am uh, someone in Japan, Norway, uh, Libya, all countries which have sent fighters, over 30,000 fighters from 80 countries estimated at the moment. And instead of wanting to see how I can fight, I want to see what can I do to make things better in my country, in my community. There is nothing that easily shows me how to do that. That's part of what we need to be working on. Just to not seem overwhelming and negative and depressing, um, do you know Steven Pinker's Better Angels yeah. of Our Nature? Okay, you can discuss aspects of it, you can have different points of view on it, but there is substantive valuable information, at least the general trends, a lot of it is true. He's recognizing that compared to 2,000 years ago, 600 years ago, the incidence of violent death in our societies has gone down dramatically. We see the horrors of industrial meat production. We see someone getting their head cut off, or the young boy whose body was lifeless on the beach. And we feel outraged at humanity. How can people let this happen? He says, do you ever stop to realize that you feel outraged? That that is actually an important sign? Because for a long time, we saw these things happening, and we weren't outraged. We just thought it was normal, or we went to the Colosseum to see people hacked apart, and actually thought that that was a nice way to spend a Sunday afternoon. So the fact that overwhelmingly people are rejecting violence, that overwhelmingly in every country around the world, people are rejecting war by governments as a way of dealing with conflict, that is positive. Um, just a few figures, and sorry, this would have been much neater if it had come up one by one. World military expenditure is every year between 1.5 to 1.7 trillion dollars. That figure is entirely wrong. According to the Government Accounting Office of the United States, the US alone, if you include medical, pension, everything that truly goes into the cost of their war system, medical and pensions for soldiers, for veterans, then their annual budget is $3 trillion to maintain the war system. But let's just stick with this incorrect figure of 1.5 to 1.7. That covers what's spent on weapons, equipment, bases, military deployment globally. That's $5 million a minute. This is what we call realistic. This is what you can go to any of the different faculties and clues that teach political science or international relations, and the professors will tell you this is security, this is how we deal with these situations. Then there's the things that we're told are naive, you know, for the idealists, for the hippies, for people who don't get how things work. Like this idea of ending world hunger. How can you be so naive? Ending world hunger, the most exaggerated and ambitious costing put by the UN, what would it cost? Let's, let's come up with a huge figure and then let's add 10 billion more. And the biggest figure we could imagine, what it would cost, 30 billion. That's what we're told is naive and unrealistic. Ending malaria, 8.4 billion. Providing clean water to every human being who doesn't have it in the world, between 10 to 30 billion. Universal education from kindergarten to university for every girl and boy child in the world that doesn't have it. 20.7 billion. That's what we're told is naive and unrealistic. 1.7 trillion, security. How much security does it really provide? I don't have time because I spent too much in the earlier part to really go into it, but I'm developing a piece of work now on what we call strategic effectiveness. The concept that you can measure, evaluate, and assess the effectiveness of different policies in dealing with conflict and crisis situations. And you can empirically see did this policy help? And what we're actually seeing is that war and violence make the situation worse. As General Toussignon, the commander of all UN forces in Rwanda after the genocide, has gone on record as saying, soldiers and the army can never solve conflict. It's not what they exist for. They can kill, they can't actually solve social, economic, political issues. Uh, Sir General Rupert Smith, Deputy Commander of the First Invasion of Iraq, Commander of all British forces in Northern Ireland for a long time, he wrote a book called The Utility of Force, which effectively says force, armed, military, violent force, does not have utility. It makes it worse. The best way to recruit new people to join ISIS is to be bombing Syria and Iraq. That gets people to be joining. Okay. There's more, and this is a quote. Every gun that is made, every warship launched, 
Every rocket fired signifies, in the final sense, a theft from those who hunger and are not fed, those who are cold and are not clothed. This world in arms is not spending money alone. It is spending the sweat of its laborers, the genius of its scientists, the hopes of its children. This is not a way of life at all in any true sense. Under the clouds of war, it is humanity hanging on a cross of iron. Who said that? A radicalist? A left-wing, anti-government? No, Supreme Commander-in-Chief Dwight D. Eisenhower, President of the United States, in his State of the Union address, calling upon people in his country to wake up, saying that as president he'd never had less power and that his country was run by a military-industrial complex. That was about 60 years ago. Much more extreme today. There's a lot more, and I apologize because I didn't get into it, negative and positive dynamics of where we are. But I just want to show you one thing. Ah, do you know this one? Rebecca Costa's The Watchman's Rattle. She's talking about all the crises and challenges we face. And she's looking historically at collapse of civilizations. And she looks at every major civilization that has collapsed throughout history. And she's saying that there's a lot of science research studies on what leads civilizations to collapse. Some speak about overexploitation of natural resources. Some speak about uh, corruption in the government system. Some speak about the continual pursuit of wars. And this is what leads um, the Khmer civilization, the Mayan civilization, which lasted 6,000 years. Um, the uh, Roman Empire, this is what led them to collapse. And what she says is, all of them to varying degrees are right, and they're all asking the wrong thing. The point isn't why did it collapse in terms of the problems it faced. The point is, why did these advanced civilizations know about these problems for years and not solve them? And what she says is crisis and problems build up exponentially. You have one lily pad, then you have two lily pads, then you have four lily pads, then you have 16 lily pads. Exponential growth. So that the day before something collapses, it looks like it's still OK. And then, and this is the last thing that I want to show you. I'd love to have the time to tell you the stories of every single one of these people. They're no different than you or I. I have asked thousands of school children, politicians, journalists around the world, can you name 10 war heroes? Any child above the age of 9 or 10, anywhere in the world can do that. Can you name 10 wars throughout history? Again, any child can do that. Can you tell me the names of 10 nonviolent leaders, of 10 successful nonviolent movements? Very, very few people in the world can do that. Here are some amazing ones. And then the last picture which comes up is this one. Tank Man. And I show a version of it that very few people have ever seen. We don't even know if he was part of the demonstration. He saw something wrong that was happening. And we have gone in with photo technology to see what's in his bag. It's groceries. And in his other hand, it's a suitcase. Uh, sorry, a briefcase. People think he was on his way home from work. And he saw this happening, and he stepped in front of the tanks. He saw something that was happening, and he did what he could. We ask, how did people stand by as Jews, communists, priests, gay and lesbian people, human rights workers and others were taken off to concentration camps and killed? How could people see what was happening? How could people stand by and do nothing? Well, what the hell do you think is happening right now when you turn on your televisions and you see people drowning in the Mediterranean? more than died in the entire history of the existence of the Berlin Wall. So I should have spent a lot more time on what we can do. And if we have any time for discussions and questions, I don't know if we do, but I'll try and dedicate it to that so that we can focus on it. September 12th, all across Europe, all around the Middle East and the world, people are organizing a day of solidarity to call for human support for humans in need, for refugees and call upon ending the wars in Iraq, Syria, and Libya. Already, from Hungary to Germany to elsewhere, citizens are organizing solidarity and support. Isn't it a little sad that Romania did more under Ceausescu in 1968 
to provide support for refugees fleeing Czechoslovakia than we are doing today, where our leadership tells us, but we're not set up for handling that. Romania has one of six UNHCR centers in the world, in Romania, specifically for handling support for refugees. We're completely set up for it. Timisoara. And the same way that there are two million Romanians working abroad in other people's countries, contributing, most of them, incredibly productively, sometimes working far harder abroad than they ever did back home. I can promise you that the doctors, the engineers, the journalists, and the many people fleeing Syria and Iraq would be working incredibly hard. It would be a benefit to the country. If you want, we can look at how do you deal with conflicts? How do you do peace building? We've had a dramatic reduction in war in the world today. All of that. I'm sorry for not getting as much into that, but I hope this was interesting. Thank you very much for your time. And thank you for <laughs>
or contributing to find a solution. Actually the opposite. Right now in the Middle East, almost every country is involved in fueling wars in the countries beside it. It's one of the most dangerous situations we have seen in centuries. This has never happened before at this scale in the Middle East and North Africa. It is insanely dangerous and killing hundreds of thousands. How about outside? Romania, Norway, the United States, the United Nations, other countries, could they help? They're not. Most of them are involved in fueling war. Even Norway, we're sending special combat forces. So there is no country, no government, no actor today. What is the hope? <coughs> what could be done? <coughs> Just going to see. Tell me if you see this. I want to show you something really quickly, and it may be hard to do. <coughs> do you see the Facebook? OK. This is Farhan Ibrahim. That's him getting trained in a program by International Association of Human Values. They use breathing techniques to help us know how to deal with stress, trauma, and improve our ability to just breathe, feel calm. They use it in the most high violent incidents prisons, and it leads to 70% reductions in violence or more. They use it for combat veterans and others. It's amazing, the effect of breathing techniques. Farhan is your city from Sanjar Mountain. I don't know if you remember last year, it was in all the news, Sanjar Mountain in Iraq was surrounded by ISIS. The people on the mountain were starving. ISIS was attacking village by village on the mountain, kidnapping thousands of young girls and taking them into forced rape. They call it marriage. They'll marry a woman 50 to 50 different men in a day. And many were killed, thousands and thousands. Remember, there's a huge airlift to try and provide food to the people in Sanjar Mountain. Sanjar is a young, pardon? Yes, yes it is. Sanjar is a young man, younger or about the same age as most of the men in this room. His sister was raped. Many of the people he went to school with were killed. His teacher was killed. He joined a volunteer group that's trying to gather data on what happened. They're taking pictures of the bodies that were left out eaten by animals or left in 50 degree heat after they were killed. Imagine what that does psychologically for a human being. You're taking pictures of the dead bodies of people that you grew up with and knew. And I was in Dohuk. I'd been asked to come there by three young men, one Yazidi, one Kurd, one uh, Christian, and uh, to help them see what they could do in the middle of this war. And Farhan came to a workshop we were doing three-day workshop, three-day workshop. He came to it that morning, and he was vibrating. You could see his, his anger. You could feel it emanating. You know how you've seen someone when they're pissed off or they're in a bad mood? You can feel that. And he told me later that that morning, two, of his, two or three of his friends went to the front line to fight against ISIS. He was supposed to go with them, but one of his friends convinced him, come to this workshop. He came. It inspired him. He got a further training by us in June. Now he's doing training programs in camps of displaced people and reaching out to the same young men that would be recruited to fight, but he's recruiting them for something different. They have built something they call the Citizens Peace Movement of Iraq. They're mobilizing people of every religion, every ethnicity, every tribe. They are saying, let us stand up. In the midst of this war, if we want to end it, we have to end it ourselves. How? Not by bombing and killing people from the other side, but saying, brother, come back to us. Telling their brothers not to go fight, but bringing them back. Facilitating negotiations. On the ground in Syria, there are business leaders, tribal leaders, religious leaders that have facilitated more than 8,000 ceasefires on the ground to stop fighting in local areas. It is not easy, any more than the building of the Hadrian Collider, any more than finding how we solve HIV AIDS, but we have ended wars in the midst of them. Here, they're trying to build a people's movement, and they need support from people worldwide. And one of the things that I meant to say is that in the same way we had movements that ended apartheid that brought down the Berlin Wall, we need a global movement today to abolish the war system. I have a question. Uh, you're targeting the leaders, uh, the kids in schools. Why don't you create programs to teach them peace from kindergarten so they won't be soldiers? 20 years later. That's exactly what we're doing. 
We have uh, an intern with us from Italy who's come to the institute to learn how they can work on introducing peace education in the Italian system. We have a team that works here in Romania. The problem is we are doing, at the moment, what you could call an intervention-based model. <coughs> this is how most NGOs work. We develop a project where our team goes into a school, works with teachers, works with uh, students, and we do peace education. That's intervention-based. It's based on our work. What you want is integrated. That instead of us going into a school, every teacher in teacher's college is trained in peace education. The curricula introduces peace education. Yeah. And it becomes part of the system. Yeah. yeah. So in some countries like New Zealand, they've passed legislation. In New Zealand, every single school child gets peace education all the way through. In other countries, in Norway, the largest educational review in Norway actually recommended that the single most important development in the Norwegian education system would be to introduce higher education on peace studies. There they focus at the university level. This is being done. There's an international association of peace <coughs> educators. And it's sort of like the same way we all learn math. Everyone had math in school? Is everyone here a physicist or a mathematician? <laughs> awesome. Um, we're not all, you know, because to learn maths, you don't need to all be going into higher sciences using maths. As a human being, it helps us. Some of us do it better, some of us a little more challenging, but we all learn maths. Imagine if we all learned how to deal with conflicts effectively. Yes, right from kindergarten up. Interestingly, the World Economic Forum, when they won the largest gathering of major capital economic interests, when they looked at the most important qualities of successful leadership, the ability to handle complexity, the ability to solve crises and problems, the ability to work effectively with others, the ability to inspire solutions, their list they came up with, all of that is what you learn in peace education. George Carlin had a joke about the in the United States. They want well, newborn life, newborn babies, and that's what you Very few want that. And when people critique what's happening in the US or elsewhere. A lot of crap coming out of the United States. No, no, I, I know, but I'm just saying in general, there's a lot of crap coming out. Absolutely, yes. But for example, the last war in Iraq, 2003, wouldn't have been possible without Romania's support and provision of Romanian airspace. That was one of the things that the Pentagon identified as necessary to carry out the war. It was our complicity, the fact that we enabled it. Romania and Kuwait, two critical airspace zones. So. But it's very hard to decide. I mean, uh, you talk about the war in Iraq. And we see now, we don't have exactly the brightest idea. But uh, when you go back and, and you look and you see a very violent leader, but a stable political economical situation, and you, as an ordinary citizen, are placed in the position to ask yourself do those people deserve to keep having that violent leader? Or should we somehow try and help them? Even if their society is not still fully equipped with enough reformers and enough people who actually want the change. And I put myself in this, the situation of actually being the person living in that country. What would I want? And I tend to believe I would want my radical leader to disappear. And it's very hard to, to decide beforehand. That is a good intervention or not so hard. The the causes, the, the causes that you're saying is really important to get because I had this epiphany moment when I was picked up by a taxi driver in Syracuse, and he was telling me why he supported the war, and the motivations behind why he supported the war I could totally understand, and they were the same piece reason why millions of people around the world were demonstrating against the war. He saw a horrible leader, people suffering, and he could not accept that. On my last trip into Iraq, I met a US mercenary who felt that he was called by God to go to fight because he could not sit back while people were being raped and killed. Gandhi said that he prefers someone who has the courage to pick up a gun and fight than the coward who sits back and does nothing. And he said in his cause, he too needed the courage and the willingness to die for what he believed in, and he had that but there was no cause for which he would kill. Now, if we believe, the first time I demonstrated against Saddam Hussein was 1987. I think I was in like grade seven or eight at the time. If we believe that we should remove authoritarian regimes, okay, yes, totally. Lifelong activists working with that. I wrote my first letter against the apartheid regime when I was eight years old.
So I'm totally on board. But then let's pay attention to the fact that the majority of military dictatorships and authoritarian regimes in the world in the last 60 years have been removed through democratic nonviolent struggle. Actually, it often takes longer using armed means. I've had this discussion with FARC in Colombia where they've had 40 years of armed struggle. That didn't move them any quicker. What it takes is strategic effectiveness and knowing how to do it well. And what's amazing is how successful we've been with nonviolence, even though people haven't been trained at it. When we did train them, Serbia, Georgia, Ukraine, it took months. Granted, the aftermath was totally screwed up because no one pays attention to it. Only thing that they were interested in, these were US paid organizations, they went and trained them, how do you remove a regime? The reality is it is not hard to remove a regime. The challenge is, like Egypt, like Iraq, when you remove a regime, everything that happens after. Don't have time to go into it now, but there's a publication, Searching for Peace in Iraq. There's also books by US military officers themselves who had full access, looking at how Iraq descended into civil war. The reality was it was not about the removal of Saddam Hussein. That was done badly. I do not in any way support it. I was working all around the world to prevent that war. We could have supported people in Iraq. We could have removed the sanctions, which were killing far more people in Iraq than Saddam Hussein ever did. And we have killed more since than Saddam Hussein ever did. There were many things that were possible. We need to start learning them so that we're not faced with this false question of thinking that the only option is to go in through military. Until very recently, I just think the obvious to me that uh, you know radical leaders should be removed. But uh, um, for a year or so, I have a friend who lives in Iraq, and um, he keeps telling me this that he does not want any kind of revolution in his country. That he he sees the attitude of the society around him changing, and he, all he wants is for the reformists in his country to get more power. And she's very happy about the ongoing deal right now and the removal of the sanctions. And she also told me about this, about how much sanctions kill people. So I'll be totally open with you. I supported, studied, grew up dreaming about armed revolutionary movements from the time I was very, very young. Um, when I was 13, I began actively learning about. By 17, I had read all of Lenin, most of Marx. 18, had read all of Marx. Um, and many others, Chinese Revolution, Vietnamese Revolution, writings of Ho Chi Minh, writings of Mao Zedong. I was very much on armed struggle. It's interesting, empirical study has been done. Countries which have gone, undergone armed revolution, which as activists and radicals we often feel we must overthrow with the force of the gun. Um, often they have more authoritarian or as authoritarian regimes after. Often you have mass pogroms in which millions and millions die. And there's the reason why even revolutionaries have written the revolution eats its children. By 1938, over 90% of the Bolshevik party that had stood with Lenin was dead, in prison, or exiled by Stalin. Because if you bring about your ideology that it's okay to kill the one who disagrees with you and you can see through violent means, you're just the same thing you're trying to change. Interestingly, those revolutions which have happened through democratic nonviolent struggle have led to significant increases in human rights, improving situation, but it doesn't just become permanent. We need to keep it up. So I was asked, what is the one sentence I want people to take away from this talk when we were looking at preparing yesterday? The one sentence, I'm not trying to embellish it, I'm not trying to make it seem romantic, but, one sentence before, there are issues and things which we should be standing up for. One sentence to take away. There are things every single one of us can do to contribute to and be part of the changes that you may believe in or wish to see in the world. Millions and millions more doing that today, and there is a need. If anyone would like to be in touch afterwards, I'd love to hear your ideas. If I said something you radically disagree with, bring it on. Let's talk about it. Um, but if you'd like to see what we can do together or share what you're doing, I'd love to learn more about it.